This is my dog. Looks really, 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 really scary, but uh, I have a point for it, and a point for the title, too. Uh, User-centered design is going to get us killed. There is an atomic bomb there, and this is a homage to Mike Montero, who came a few months ago to another of these conferences and talked about how designers uh, build the atomic bomb. What I want to do with this talk is shake a little bit our concept of design and how we have been designing and thinking about design in the last 20 years. How many of you here are designers and design every day? Quite a lot. I might get lynched today, okay, cool. Um, right, it's, it's a bit exaggerated, right? User-centered design is not gonna get us killed, but we need to think about it a bit differently. Uh, what do you need to hear, or why should you hear what I have to say? Well, I have, I'm Yolanda Martin. I'm Director of Service and Platform Design at Farfetch. I've been designing for over 20 years, and most of those 20 years, I've been indoctrinated on user-centered design. How many of you are firm believers of user-centered design? It's okay, it's okay, so am I, so am I, it's fine. Good. Um, the last five years, I've been more into large systemic design, and I've been practicing something called platform design or ecosystem design. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Uh, I bet that a lot of you thought when the, you saw the title of my talk that I was going to talk about this kind of design. This is not user-centered design, it's just bad design. So we're not going to talk about this, although it's fun. Uh, we're going to talk about paradigm change, how the world has changed in the last 10 years, how e-commerce has changed, how products have changed, how we have changed. There is the economy of sharing. Now there are so many sharing something apps out there and companies. Uh, companies are, and e-commerce is not marketplaces anymore. They are platforms and ecosystems and everything is so big and so interconnected. We have a huge responsibility when we are designing now. And what we have been doing for the last 20 years and what we have been indoctrinated in is user-centered design. That focus, that hyper-focus on the user. We've been asked all the time to put the center, the, 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 the user at the center, to put ourselves on the, on the user's shoes. That has created a bit of an egocentric design. We design for ourselves a lot of times. Yes, we do user research. Yes, we, do, we research and design for our users. But our users are like us. And we are looking at the problem in a really, really focused way. And that has worked great. That, that type of, of design and that type of discipline has brought us incredible advantages. We have designed amazing things, and we have improved amazing things by using uh, user-centered design and human-centered design. We've advanced the world in many, many, many ways. And we're proud, right? Also, the design discipline has grown. We went from being uh, uh, logo designers and uh, coloring between the lines designers and glitter and glue designers to product designers to user designers to, you know, being big into companies, now design-led companies around the world, and we are proud, right? We as designers can change the world. We've done amazing things there, chief design officers and so on. But have we really changed the world? Have we actually made any dent or any effort to sort out any of these problems? Can we? Should we? Nobody. <laughs> Who feels responsible every day in the work we do of any of these things? These are systemic problems. And design has not fixed any of them. Because we are always focused on a very, very small piece of the things that we do. We're not thinking of any of those things when we do our everyday job. 
And as I was talking about Mike Montero when we started, right? Mike Montero, who knows who Mike Montero is? Not so many people. Well, he's a great designer, and he's big in talking about design ethics. And design ethics has become a big thing uh, in the last couple of years, talking about how much responsibility we have morally as designers. We have a great responsibility morally as designers, but we also have a great responsibility for the things that are physical as designers. Um, and design hasn't fixed anything of the big systemic problems. Because user-centered design is a discipline that looks at the whole environment, but then hyper-focuses on a problem. We get constantly asked to look at the uh, smallest type of slide of problem to get the product out quickly. We get told to design and think in two week sprints. Don't look too far, don't look too big, don't look too, too wide. Concentrate on a hyper-focused problem and just solve that. But that's myopic. We don't look further, we don't look bigger. And most of our hyper-focused problems live in ecosystems. And if we don't actually look at the systemic problems, well, things like this happened, right? Uber and Lyft are super proud of their design practices, and they should be. They have fantastic design teams, and they have built amazing companies, and they have solved a huge user problem, right? We all, a few years ago, were trying to get cars and hike rides and share uh, trips with people, and it was intensely complicated. And they did something really, really good. They manage, by user-centered design, to focus on the problem of the user. Their hypothesis was that if, we, if they made car sharing better and easier, people will share more rides and traffic will reduce. That's not what happened, because human traffic is a systemic problem. It's not a user problem. The user problem was sorted, and we can all book cabs really, really easy and really efficiently. However, the traffic problem got worse. A recent report says that it got 2.6 times worse in most of the cities. So going back to our systemic problems, we are choking in more CO2 because a user problem was fixed. Because when designing for car sharing, they didn't look at the bigger ecosystem of the problem. So yes, the people that was riding cars or sharing cars was doing it faster, but it also made it easier for all of those that walk, cycle, or took public transport. How many of us has ditched the bus because it was raining or we were tired and it's so easy to just get an Uber? You know, I just, just get an Uber. Today is a bit of a drizzle. I usually cycle to work, but you know, if it's too cold or it's a bit of a drizzle, I just get an Uber. So a lot of people started to do that and now there is more traffic in the cities. So another very, very good case of user-centered um, design fixing a fantastic user issue. <coughs> How many of you use, you use pods every day? Nespresso machines and pod coffees. Not so many. I'm proud. Proud of you. Yay. Uh, one third of every coffee in the world gets, comes from this, right? When it was invented and designed, and this is one, 112 million worth of pods was sold last year in the UK alone. That's a lot of coffee sold like this. So when, when the pods were invented, right, when, when, uh, when, uh, when this came along, was the idea that 
people wanted the, their espressos and their good coffee quickly and, and easily. That people wanted many varieties of coffee and kind of uh, new flavors of coffee ready available. And that if they had families or gatherings or parties, they, they wanted to have a coffee made fast and with many, many different kinds so people could have whatever they wanted. It solved all of that. However, it created a tremendous, tremendous problem. There is an environmental issue. It's not only pollution, and it's also a chemical issue. Those aluminum pods are very, very difficult to recycle because the cups are plastic and there is always coffee at the bottom. So although many of the companies say they recycle them, is really difficult. And these are the aluminum ones. The plastic ones don't get recycled. It's so bad the problem <coughs> that the city of Hamburg has actually forbidden pod coffee machines in the public run buildings. And it will happen in more and more cities because we are trying to fix the systematic problem of waste. Right? And although these pods can be recycled, they actually create waste in the first place. Because actually, to make yourself espresso, you don't need a pot. You just need a coffee machine and a jar of coffee. Right? But we solve a, a, a user problem, and we created a systemic one. Like those examples, there are more. I mean, and probably there are more and more around the world, right? But I don't want to make this list so big that you all get depressed and walk out of here wanting to do something else. Um, Amazon next day delivery, which we all love, right? We all love buying our books or our coffee or whatever and get it delivered next day. But there is a very famous article that analyzed, or actually a study, that analyzed the impact of next day delivery that Amazon has created. They had to displace people from neighborhoods to build bigger warehouses. So it created a displacement problem. It has also had to lower so much the per hour rate of the warehouse workers that has created modern day slavery. How many people have heard about this? Quite a lot of you. And it came because Amazon wanted to give the customer their products the next day. And that's a good thing, right? We want to satisfy the customer demand. We want to make the users happy. However, if we don't look at the consequences of that in the bigger ecosystem, we can create huge, huge problems. Airbnb, another huge success. Everybody books Airbnb, everybody enjoys having Airbnbs. Most of us don't book hotels, including myself, ever again. But it's driving gentrification. It's pushing families and people that has lived in city centers for years and years out of the city because it's hiking rent and it's hiking house prices to the point that now policymakers in the cities are starting to make policies against it hiking taxes for Airbnb people and so on. Um, and the crazy proliferation of apps. This is my favorite one. I only read the report a few weeks ago. But actually having so many apps to sort out every single little problem of our lives every day, I have a bloody app that measures how many minutes I brush my teeth. <laughs> me anxious. Oh my god, I'm not brushing them enough. It's created mental issues and anxiety to people to the point that now there are apps to control your apps. So we have tried to sort out so many of our very hyper-focused users' problems that we are creating humongous other problems. Right? I'd rather brush my teeth and don't know how many minutes I have brushed them than have the anxiety of thinking that my teeth are going to fall because I didn't do the two and a half minutes that I should. Who cares, right? So, less depressing. What can we do? What can we do as designers? What can we do as humans in general, right? Well, we can do a lot. 
we can design for interconnectedness. And that's why I was saying that this is a paradigm change, right? Because we have been always, and this is the e-commerce summit, right? And we're talking about e-commerce and how people buy and whatnot. The world has changed on how they sell, how they distribute, how they do uh, localization, and so on and so forth. Design needs to change too. We need to start designing for the transaction in between people, for the interactions in between more than one people and those people and their environments. And when, what happens? What is the network effect and the butterfly effect of every decision we make? We were saying before, designs have become superheroes. But, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that the time of being egocentric designers has to stop. We need to start looking at everyone else and the environment where we design. And it's hard, damn it. It's really, really hard. I've been kind of practicing platform design for about five years. Only the last two years I have become very, very aware of what it means. Right? And designing for interconnectedness is not easy because focusing on a very, very small sliver of a problem, that hyperfocus is quite easy. You know, we solve that and we feel so proud. We put that button higher and our conversion rate went up 10%. Yay! Makes us good. But when you have to look at reducing the friction of every actor involved in the interaction that you are designing for, that's hard. That's when you have to start working with service designers, with researchers, with engineers, with the architects, with infrastructure, with massive teams. Everybody has to collaborate and work together to make sure that the impact that you are, of what you are designing is reduced to a minimum, reducing the friction of every transaction. Um, you can find a lot more about this. This is a very good quote of, um, of Simon Cicero. Uh, the platform design toolkit is open source, so please go and have a good look and educate yourselves. Right. This is kind of my summary of, as, as I was saying, you know, what can we do as designers? Even the ones that are not designing for platforms, because it's not something that all designers do. Just look beyond the user. Even when you're asked to be hyper-focused on a problem, try to bring it back into the, into the ecosystem. Don't, don't just look at the tree. Have a little look about the forest around it and how the decision that you're making for that user is going to impact around. Also think of the long-term impact of your decision, right? It's not just what is happening today, it's what is going to happen in a couple of years, including to that user. Back to my brushing teeth app. Would you ever think that that will give me anxiety if you were designing an app like that? Well, maybe if you thought of a longer term impact, you would, and decide against it and say, you know what? I'm not doing this. Uh, and always look at reducing the frictions of your interactions, including these this huge ecosystemic ones. Right? This is very important. We're killing the planet. We're creating more proper, pro poverty than ever before. And there is more mental illness than ever before. We need to start doing stuff about this. Okay, this is not this is not a practice that doesn't. I mean, it happens, right? There are platform designers out there, and my team is one of them. So at Farfetch, we practice platform design. We practice it every day by reducing the friction of every tool that we design. So we design the B2B tools of the Farfetch ecosystem. Farfetch moved from being a marketplace to being a platform the last three years. And now we have a set of tools and services to empower and, and, um, 
and help many different boutiques, brands, uh, and um, service providers for e-commerce to thrive in our environment. So our mandate is constantly making sure that every decision we make makes sense with every entity within our environment. We are all the time looking to reduce the transactional cost. And last month, we launched a sustainability program. So we have added redu reduction of footprint in every transaction that we do. So we also check and make sure that when we are designing, that interaction is also reducing our footprint. There are lots of us. So this is the whole team. So it's not something that is an isolated designer in a corner doing that platform thing and ecosystemic design. It's the whole team. Researchers, UXers, UI designers, everyone is being um, taught and, and, uh, and we have all done courses on platform and ecosystemic design. And now, last but not least, we're hiring. This is a massive plug. <laughs> Our team is growing so much, and the practice of platform design has become so important that we have, these are only three, but in our career side, there are about 10 roles for a start of the future, black and white, and for fetch.com, all platform designers. So thank you very much. And if you want to ask anything, please come to me. I love talking about this stuff. Or uh, if you want to know more about platform design and ecosystemic design, go to those links and get informed.